Welcome and thanks for joining me for the Gut Health Turnaround Series 2.0, 21 Ways to Heal Your Gut, Reclaim Your Energy, and Look and Feel Amazing. My name is Leah Klein, Health and Wholeness Coach, and I will be your host. Today I am being joined by Alexa Shrim, was it? Um, Shrim, but that's Shrim. okay. <laughs> I need to write a E there. So I, I know, it. yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, she's going to be talking about why you should quit snacking. So this should be interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, thanks for having me. All righty. And our, just to give you a little background before we get going on the interview, um, Alexa is a busy mom of three girls and author behind the site Simple Roots Wellness. She received her bachelor's degree in nutrition and has taken a holistic approach to teaching people how the body functions and make recommendations from this understanding. Alexa has a passion for helping people reach their goals of optimal health through teaching them the importance of eating real food and how easy and delicious these changes can be. Alexa is also passionate about shedding light on many of the myths and misunderstandings that are perpetuated in the world of wellness. Through her award-winning podcast, Simple Roots Radio, taking once complicated nutrition issues and simplifying them, she enjoys helping her readers shift, sift through the nonsense and teaches them how to start eating to support health for life using real foods, helping them to eat to live. Always a good idea. <laughs> so, yes. So let's start off with how you first uh, got into nutrition. Yeah, so my nutrition story kind of began back when I was a child in the high school years when I thought I was indestructible and that I would live forever, never develop any health complications or anything like that. I was a active, you know, um, fairly in shape high schooler, but I got done diagnosed with GERD, um, which is a form of severe acid reflux. And, you know, I was just kind of having these complications and um, it wasn't anything, you know, it, it wasn't anything greatly severe. Um, it didn't inhibit my ability to do much, but it was still an annoying complication, right? And so I went to the doctor thinking that I would just be prescribed medications like you always do when you go to the doctor. And I had a really wise doctor at the time who was very into integrative health. Um, and this was like the first time that my eyes were open to a different world of health. And that was health that was in your own hands. And so when I went to the doctor, you know, she diagnosed me with GERD. She prescribed me a, medica a medication, but she gave me an ultimatum and basically said, I'm going to give you this prescription, but I'm going to also tell you what you can do to change this, like to reverse this, that it, the, the medication is not a long-term fix to this. And so she, you know, wrote down a whole diet plan and things that I needed to work on. And she basically said, if you don't do these things and you come back looking for another prescription, I am not your doctor. You know, you need to go find someone else who's going to do that because she believed wholeheartedly that why I was plagued with GERD was simply because of my diet that I was living off of, you know, a typical high school diet, eating late, you know, pizza after school with friends and, and kind of all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and so it really opened my eyes to, whoa, like, isn't she supposed to be prescribing me medications? And who is she to say that if I just changed my life and, you know, like that this could be different and um, so I started to think about that, you know, I only had like one round, which probably was like about 30 days. And I just really became aware of how many people struggled with health in general. And, you know, this issue of weight and watching family members be on the next diet and just, you know, kind of just that obsession that we have with health. And yet no one seemed to get the results that they wanted. And so I was kind of like on this big hunt to figure out like, why was that? And like, like, why was health, why did we make health so complicated? Um, and, and so I'm always been a simplifier. I like to find the easiest solution to every, every path that I can. And I've done this all throughout my schooling, you know, and, um, and so that's kind of like where my, my health mission started was back in high school when I got that and just kind of being fascinated by that. Um, and from there, you know, I went on to school to what I thought was going to be medical school, going to buy, um, first starting out in biology. Um, but again, it just didn't feel right. And, um, yeah, that's when I learned about nutrition and the path that nutrition could take me. And so I then went on to get my degree in nutrition and, um, my master's since then. Mm -hmm. All right. And so obviously you're learning and 
uh, of gut health started from, you know, kind of ground zero with your own experience since it was a mm -hmm. gut issue, though it's not an issue, but yeah. Right, <laughs> right. Um, Still the same thing, from, yeah. From the very beginning, so it was a very much a part of your um, transition to learning about it uh, from the beginning. So yeah. uh, why do you feel that quitting snacking is beneficial for people? Yeah. So I, it wasn't until like this past year, I really got into studying hormonal health, um, again, from own experiences, but also seeing so many of my clients coming with just, I just have hormonal or thyroid issues or, um, you know, all of that, but really what's the underlying issue that it's coming from. And interestingly enough, you know, like we, what we're going to hear and find throughout this whole summit is that how much of our hormones are linked to our gut and our brain, you know, like there's this whole triangular pattern that goes along with it. Um, and so it really came out of the study of hormones that I started understanding and trying to study snacking. Um, and um, one of the things that I found, which I found over and over and over again in ancient medicine and Chinese medicine and all these other places, which is not well talked about in America because we still live off the six small meals a day or definitely needing a snack, is simply that our bodies are not meant to have a continuous stream of food in our system, hormonally or our GI system. I mean, just to talk, because this is a gut health summit and not a hormone summit, but they kind of go hand in hand, yeah. is that our GI system is not meant to run on you know a 12 to 18 hour cycle every day. I always kind of like to think of it as like a runner or someone who's a, an athlete, right? And they're out working out and you know, the, the advice is that you shouldn't work out all day, every day. And by all means, you should definitely have a rest day in there, right? Um, we know rest is valuable, um, but we forget that all aspects of our body need rest, including our GI system. So the constant stream of food is really um, diminishing the, the work of our stomach and, you know, our small intestines and what it does. And it just causes a, a constant stress on that. Um, and so hormonal speaking, you know, there's a wholly, totally different world on why we do that. But I think really it can come back to the gut and just the stress that a continuous stream of energy has on our body. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, you mentioned the, uh, the philosophy that's been around for quite a while and still is very prevalent of uh, yeah. you need to eat every two hours or, you know, to keep your blood sugar stable. And what do you say yeah. to that in your philosophy? <laughs> Right. Yeah. Well, that's a very common philosophy and um, it's very efficient for people, what we call sugar burners. So people who are really relying on carbohydrates as their main fuel source, um, our bodies really uh, are going to cry out for hunger because what happens when you eat a lot of carbohydrates is your blood sugar spikes, right? And so we have that inconsistency. Um, and then it also will drop just as high as it spikes. And so to prevent that drop or that low or the roller coaster ride that so many people experience is is the train of thought is like, just never let your body get to that low, which we require you eating every two hours. Um, and so it's like your body goes on a roller coaster instead of crashing, it just kind of, you know, tops down at the, at the mid peak before you eat again, before it rises back up. Um, so in some sense, it prevents your body from crashing. I don't think it really does a great job of controlling blood sugar. It just prevents that feeling like the hunger and the headaches and the grouchiness and the brain fog. However, our body is not designed, like that's not the primary fuel source that our body really wants. That's an adapted one. It's a really quick source, but it's not the ideal source. The ideal source is that we would rely on body fat stores and dietary fat for our main source of energy. Um, and regardless, our body has the means to do this. You know, our body is not designed to need food every few hours. Um, our body really wants to function off of um, our own body stores and just really being able to rely and trust your own body that it's going to provide that. Um, and so I think it's just a change in philosophy and it's a change in hormonal flow. Um, just to speak on this really quickly, because hormones are greatly linked to our GI system as well. Um, but as long as we induce food into our system, insulin usually is present, right? Insulin usually spikes and insulin is kind of like this master hormone and that a lot of the other functions kind of cease. Um, and so our body just becomes um, kind of stagnant. Um, it doesn't function or flow as easily as it should. And what I always tell my clients, one of the easiest starting places, even before you maybe eliminate snacking is to really get into a good rhythm of what we call intermittent fasting. 
So that's allowing at least 12 hours every single night without food. And that kind of starts the basis of, okay, your body being able to switch over to the, to the natural hormonal flow and the natural way to pull energy into your body um, throughout the night using a different set of hormones, which is never going to come into the picture as long as food is present. So really, uh, they say a minimum in order to get that natural hormonal flow at night is 12 hours. You know, you could go longer than that without food, but most people don't. You know, how many people snack after dinner and, you know, have a, a snack before bed and a lot of it's emotional eating too, right? So I always say it prevents like, um, what usually is eating not induced by hunger, but by emotions or just sitting down in front of the TV and boredom and, and, and just habit. Um, and so the, the number one starting place to do this is really to get your body adapt and adjusted back to 12 hours of rest and rejuvenation. Um, and that's in the absence of food. So if you eat breakfast at 6 a.m. in the morning or 5.30 before you work out, you need to be all the way finished eating by 5.30 p.m. Um, so you really need to allow 12 hours minimum at night for your body to do that. And once you start doing that, it's amazing the, the transformation without really working at it, you know, without eliminating or restricting anything that you do eat in that 12 hour window, you can already start to see this natural transition um, in your body from craving sugar to not really craving it and really being more satisfied with larger meals that are more compact. Uh -huh. Yeah, I know in my own uh, transition uh, to eating more like this, kind of the, uh, the biggest thing I had to do was just to, you know, train myself that no, okay, I had dinner, I'm not eating anything now. Uh, right. Because yeah. I noticed a big difference in whether or not, you know, how readily I could go to sleep. Uh, if I ate mm -hmm. anything past you know, especially like eight o'clock, you know, it was like, yeah, my body was like, you know, it ain't time to go to bed yet. <laughs> you know, it was not right, yeah. at all uh, right. going to sleep. And so obviously, yeah. you know, if you have trouble sleeping, uh, <laughs> this could be part of your issue. Um, yes. Besides the gut issue, you know, <laughs> it can be more right. Fun. Well, it's kind of all linked together. And it's so yes. true that when you eat too late at night, it greatly affects your circadian rhythm. In fact, your hunger and full cycles are directly affected by how much sleep you get and, and your circadian rhythm. Um, and, you know, some would argue that outside of light, dark and lightness, yeah. um, the next best you know, signal for melatonin to either turn on or to not is if there's food in our system. Um, and so the longer food is in our system or the later it is, the less melatonin, which is our sleepy hormone or relaxation hormone is going to be released. And so, yeah, we just start this insomniac cycle um, of just not being able to sleep well. And then when we don't sleep well, our leptin and ghrelin gets all thrown out of whack because that's, you know, that the flow of leptin and ghrelin or our hunger and fullness signals is directly related to our sleep and wake cycles or how much sleep that we're actually getting. And I'm not a proponent of eight hours of sleep. I think across the board, quality when it comes to food and sleep matters much more than quantity. Um, and so, but just kind of understanding that all of this is just like, you can see how once you start that vicious cycle, it's so hard to get out of. And that six meals a day really is just, uh, you know, stepping into that vicious cycle and having a hard time getting out of it. Yeah, because yeah, I know probably um, probably everybody listening to this has had a bad night's sleep some point in their life and has right the overwhelming need to eat things that you don't really need <laughs> the next day. Right. Yeah. And when you're sleep deprived, it's it's been yeah. proven that you crave higher carbohydrates and ha higher fat foods. So junk food, right? Of course, yeah. we all know that we don't need science to prove that yeah, it's like it happens to us at regular intervals if we're not sleeping well right right so it's kind of yeah. you know one of those things where it's like okay the sleep you know sleep is really important in this topic you know as far as keeping you from snacking obviously right and right not eating in the evening is kind of one of the important things for making sure you do get the sleep <laughs> so right so yeah. it's kind of a little cycle there of, uh, you know, either yeah. a good cycle or, as you said, it's kind of a vicious cycle where it's, uh, you know, 
if you're eating bad, where it just keeps perpetuating, you know, the problem. Right. So how do you recommend people, you know, transitioning to not snacking? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think the first thing is to have in your mindset that this is not a calorie issue. It's not a restriction or deprivation principle. Um, I, I think what the coolest thing about, um, kind of my starting point for people is that we never really talk about food. I really am a big believer that yes, food matters, but how and when we eat matters far more than what and how much we eat. Um, and so I think that if we can get out of our mindset that it's not, oh, you just have to decrease your calories. And instead it's really just taking those snacks that you do eat and just adding them to meals. So my first step with people, it is always intermittent fasting. Before we even touch snacking or how often people eat throughout the day is we got to get intermittent fasting going in your body because that's the first step in cycling those hormones, right? And also helping your hunger and fullness signals. So it'll really change cravings and really just, it, it'll change the way that this can be done. Not to mention that you know, if we're not intermittent fasting, someone could wake up at seven in the morning and have breakfast, maybe not eat lunch until one again. So yeah, you really are hungry. You almost need a snack in there. You know, I'm talking that meals would be only about three to four hours apart. You know, anything longer than that is, is really kind of hard on your body unless you really are going to enter the fasting phase. Um, so keeping your meals three to four hours apart. So once you have intermittent fasting done, that's 12 hours without food at night. Um, then, you know, starting with breakfast, trying to make it from breakfast to lunch. So eliminating one snack a day. Um, and I really like the approach of breakfast to lunch because generally those meals can be closer together. So if you know you don't typically eat lunch until one, don't break your fast, um, which is just really what breakfast means, until later in the morning. So maybe you don't start eating breakfast until nine or 10. So it's not a five or six hour stretch. It's just three to four hours in the absence of food. <laughs> so you can make that little intermittent fasting window a little bit bigger. Um, but I think the critical component is that you make sure that your meals are big enough. You know, what I find so often is that people have this word snack and we've also put calories to snacks. So that's why we have the hundred calorie snack pack. Like yeah. we've induced that calories are, or that snacking is supposed to be a low calorie meal. But in fact, calories are life giving, you know, like that's the essence and the source of life. It's not what we should fear. It's that we should be eating quality of foods and enough of them. And that's really what's going to provide our body life. And that's where we can develop this efficient metabolism. And so at breakfast, that first meal of the day really should be the biggest meal of the day. Um, and I like to see the meals get dra or, you know, a little bit smaller as the day goes on because you need calories and energy right away in the morning. So if you're not eating a big breakfast or, um, you might not be eating enough to make it till lunch. I always just say start by adding one healthy thing to breakfast. Maybe it's two healthy things. Um, so it's not, again, changing what you eat for breakfast. Even if it's not a great breakfast, what two healthy things can you add to that? Maybe it's chia seeds. Maybe it's some flax meal. You know, it doesn't have to be, be like a whole nother substance, but it could literally just be like a tablespoon of chia seeds. Like it can be something really small, but that small thing has a lot of value long term. Um, so focusing your biggest meal on breakfast, and then if you can't make it to lunch, like if you're absolutely starving by the time lunch hits, either you need to only go, go three hours without eating, you know, like your meals need to be three hours instead of four hours apart, or you just need to keep adding to breakfast and figuring out a breakfast mixture that can hold you over until lunch. So it's just kind of like a learning process. I'm not a I'm not a believer that there's any one requirement or diet or principle that's going to work for everyone. You know, I think um, we can all live off of this because it's not like you have to eat exactly this many carbs for breakfast or, you know, exactly this many fat grams and then you're going to be held over. It's kind of playing with your own diet and your own body um, and understanding your own hormonal flow to understand how much you need at each of those meals. So you're kind of get into a rhythm. But I think another big principle is to make sure that you have a healthy protein and a healthy fat at every single meal. Um, so often we just find ourselves eating carbohydrates um, and carbohydrates are not filling. Um, you know, I don't have a beef with them. I think we can eat them, but I, I think alone they're never going to be good enough. Um, and so again, making sure you add a protein and fat to that to help hold you over because, because that's really where we're going to see satiety. So again, my tips would be intermittent fasting and starting with eliminating the snack from breakfast to lunch. That means like no, you know, no mocha, no coffee, basically nothing with energy 
in that amount of time. Like I limit it to water, maybe some herbal teas, anything that doesn't necessarily have to be broken down in the system. Um, so it really eliminates the stress on the GI tract. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's hopefully that's, those are helpful starting yeah, tips. That, that should be really helpful. I know that when I started doing it, I had to, um, I had to go back and look at what I was eating at my meals and stuff. Mm-hmm. When I was having problems, um, I figured, okay, well, am, am I eating something that's satisfying enough at my meal that I can like go four hours or something until my next meal? Right. And usually if I was particularly struggling, that's where the problem was, is it's like I had, mm-hmm. you know, either not eaten enough protein, fat, you know, something like that, or I had eaten, you know, too much sweet, which was also right. creating the kind of the reverse, you know, where you were hungry right. sooner, uh, right. and hadn't had enough balance in that. And that was mm-hmm. really, you know, contributing to how long the food would actually, you know, satisfy me. And how soon right. I'm feeling like, you know, I need to eat more. Um, yeah. Because uh, I've tried the whole, you know, I never really fully did six meals a day. It was kind of more like five and, yeah, things like that. Right. I, I tried to put something in the middle of the afternoon and I thought it didn't really help. Um, uh huh. It didn't help necessarily how I felt or, you know, my ability to get through the afternoon, you know, uh, you know, stuff like that. It didn't ultimately, you know, help. And it certainly uh, wasn't really helping me lose weight or anything like that. It was like, you know, it wasn't really um, serving a whole lot of useful (laughs) purpose in there. Right. Yeah. And then I, you know, I heard somebody like you that was talking about, let's, you know, we don't really need all those other, you know, little snacky. Mm -hmm. You you can just fine with breakfast, lunch, and dinner and stuff. And I'm going, right. That would probably be a good idea because I'm a grazer. And (laughs) I allow myself snack. I keep, snacking. <laughs> right. It, it starts with one right. thing and it goes to something else and to something else. And I'm going, hold it. I really didn't need all that. You know? Right. And Grazing's it, so easy to do. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. so easy to do that. And it was so much easier to just say no in the first place and, you know, not go down the rabbit hole. Uh, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. uh, just right you know, draw a line in the sand and be firm about it, you know, that, okay, no, I'm not doing that. And it's not that I won't uh, eat some at other times if it's appropriate. Uh, If my body uh, needs, you know, it's like I'm massively physically exerting myself or something, you know, and it it does actually Mm -hmm. more calories. Um, that's kind of my one right. exception and, you know, to that and where I try to keep to those, you know, three meals. What are some other factors besides, you know, like issues with the meals that could be contributing to a struggle with switching to, you know, doing like your three meals? Right. Okay. Can you repeat that question? I lost you a little bit in there. Okay. So what was, um, what are some other problems somebody could be experiencing um, if they're, besides just having not enough food or the right food with their meals, uh, the, if they're having problems switching over uh, to do it? Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that, you know, obviously the biggest one is just not eating enough during that time and not having enough of the right variety. I feel like variety goes a long ways. And we hear this all the time and people are like, uh, you know, we see so often that people are eating the same meals day in and day out. Um, and maybe structurally wise, that's fine. But satiety wise, our body really craves a variety of foods. Um, and there's a satiety power to that. If we're just eating the same foods, like if you could sit down and eat an entire bag of potato chips, one, because it's just a simple carb, but also also too, because there's not a lot of flavor to that. So your body is just, you know, not going to be as satisfied as when you sit down, you know, like I always think about five star restaurants or like, you know, these farm to table restaurants that 
serve food and they're like really small portions compared to other restaurants and it's but yet you feel so satisfied after that and so fresh almost and it's simply because of the amount of flavor that they have on that plate so our body really craves flavor in some aspect of that um but i uh, so adding flavor to your foods you know relying on fresh herbs and and other flavors to really just enhance that dish mm -hmm. um but even more than that i feel like we also need to look at at how we're eating um, and this is like the second big point that I make with people and and simply that we are an on-the-go nation we are busier than ever right we rely on convenience foods I'm not saying that's wrong um, but I am saying that there's a time and a place that your body actually prepares to eat so consistently your body's going to want to eat at the same time every single day you know, you're, you're just gonna start to get that signal just like your sleep and wake cycles are roughly at the same time. You know, if you wake up every single morning at 5.30 and then you go on vacation and you try to sleep in, it's almost impossible because your body wakes up. Um, and so your hunger fullness signals are gonna be the same way. So if you've been a six meal person for five plus years, you know, a long period of time, a year or more, right? Your body is consistently in that. No matter what, even if it's the wrong consistency, your body's still gonna cycle through that. So you kind of have to break that. So I always tell people to start out eating consistently at about the same time. You know, if you eat breakfast at, you know, 7 o'clock p.m. or 7 o'clock a.m. Um, and lunch is at noon, you know, try to keep that rhythm going, maybe bringing them in a little bit closer. But once you have what works for you, kind of keeping it set in stone. Um, outside of that, though, when we talk about the how is that, you know, on this on the go nation, we feel or we see people often eating in their car or working and eating or standing over their kitchen sink. Um, you know, I'm a busy mom and I find myself like eating lunch while I'm getting the kids' lunches plates ready, you know, like never fully sitting down. There is something really huge to sitting down and enjoying your meal. And this has to do with the autonomic nervous system. And it's, again, not something that people think about or talk about. Um, we just think it's easy to um, have, uh, what do I want to say? It's just easy to have a meal, right, and eat it on the go and think, okay, I ate and I got what I needed. But we forget that our body actually needs to prepare to eat. And that sounds really crazy, but it's similar to sleep, right? Like if you're up working or you go on a run, you can't automatically come home and just fall asleep, right? Your body needs time to prepare to eat sleep, yeah. just like your body needs time to prepare to eat. Um, and so we have to allow that time. And so one of the things that I always tell people is that the autonomic nervous system, just to not that anyone wants to talk about the nervous system because it can be overwhelming, um, but there's two phases of the autonomic nervous system. And I think this really classifies why it's important to actually sit down and enjoy a meal without really anything else going on. Um, so your body and the autonomic nervous system has multiple functions. One of them is the, um, sorry, sympathetic nervous system which is our fight-or-flight response and we probably all heard of our fight-or-flight response this is like when our body is working on just providing energy you know to our our muscles and keeping our heart beating and keeping us breathing it's it's really that response that we get when we're out working or we're on a run you know our body is strictly meant to be providing energy elsewhere the other side of the autonomic nervous system is a parasympathetic nervous system which is what we call our rest and digest phase um, and so this is where our body is not really focusing on putting energy into the muscles. Like here, your body's more in a relaxed state. And this is also where digestion occurs. Within the autonomic nervous system, our body cannot be doing both things at once. It cannot be in the fight or flight response and it cannot be digesting food. They're two totally different processes. Yet so often we as a society try to put them together. We try to make our body work in ways that it's not designed or, or equipped to do. And so it fails. You know, it, it doesn't function as well as it can. And we end up with diseases and obesity and things like this. And we question why. Well, one simple fix is to stop making our bodies do what it's not designed to do and really just get back into how our body's equipped to handle food. And that's in a rested state um, and um, a state where you're really preparing your body to eat that. So I always like to think of, or give people just to, to clarify this, like uh, think about exercising, right? If you ate a really big meal and then you went out for a race, right? You ran three miles in this race. The food is probably going to sit in your stomach, right? If not come back up, yeah. like your body is not going to be digesting that food. So you can get that sloshy feeling in your stomach. You can become nauseated. You can actually vomit it back up. You could get diarrhea. 
So your body is really trying to do whatever it can to not digest that food because it's pumping energy elsewhere. Um, and that's not, I mean, obviously those are all warning signs to your body. Like, Hey, I'm under stress. I'm under a lot of pressure. Um, and so we get backed up digestion. You know, we can also look at things like GERD, um, bloating, gassiness, uh, slow stomach emptying. And we can question like, man, why do I have so much bloating after I eat? Why do I have acid reflux? Well, the food is just not being digested well. Right. So like one of the reasons could be just, how are you eating it? Are you shoveling it in your mouth in the car on the way to work? You know, our body technically when we're driving is in a flight or flight, fight or flight response. It's not, it's not really a relaxing environment because we're always on the lookout to make sure that we're safe, right? We're, we're, you know, we really need to be in a safe environment for us to fully digest food well. And I think if we're snacking, if we're eating six meals a day, very few of us have time to actually sit down and do that, right? Um, so one of my rules that I have for myself and even for my kids, and um, it's a good practice to get into is like, okay, you might be hungry between meals and that's fine. Like it happens from time to time, right? Or hormone flow changes or, or whatever or your body's making up or, you know, the kids are growing. Um, I always say, you know, are you hungry enough to sit down and eat it at the table? <laughs> um, and it's something we can do with ourselves at night. You know, like if you're just wanting to eat, but you want to eat in front of the TV, well, you know, maybe you're not really hungry then. Mm -hmm. um, so really preparing our body to eat um, and doing so in a, in a healthy environment um, without fear. Um, so I always just like to, to tell that because I think then it brings into the perspective of like, okay, like now I understand why my body needs, why sitting down at the dinner table is so important. We hear all, all the time, like statistically kids are less likely to become addicts and yeah. it increases their IQ. They're more likely to finish school and go on to college when they eat family dinners. Um, and again, it greatly affects uh, the hormonal flow of our brain and just our body in general. Um, and so I'm really like, a, I really think there's a value, not saying you have to sit at the dinner table, but I think there's value in enjoying food um, and taking time for that um, and not just doing it on the run, which so often happens with snacking or grazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. As long as you're doing yeah. something else at the same time, you're Right. Finding your focus and you're not trying to multitask. Right. Yeah. You're not able right. to just focus on the eating. So um what would you suggest to our listeners is something they could do today? Probably some of what we just talked about. Um mm -hmm. as far as just pick pick a meal and actually what? sit at the table. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, I think it's pretty basic. I mean, I don't think any of these requirements are something that people really have to, they're not, it's not an emotion, emotional investment. You know, I'm not sitting here saying you need to eliminate this whole macronutrient or take these foods out, which I think so often our society gets stuck on is restriction and deprivation and starvation that we all throw up our hands and think not another thing. Um, and I think these are really because nowhere in here did I say anything but add to your meals, right? So um, I think it, you know, it takes the emotional and uh, the cultural investment out of food um, and it simply puts it into the how and the when, which I think are far easier to control than um, the what. And so, you know, my tips for you today are to stop eating after supper, you know, try to allow three hours tonight before bed to let your body to prepare for nighttime and rest and digest the food that you did. So stop eating three hours before bed. So maybe that means skipping your nighttime snack or, you know, eating in front of the TV um, my number two tip would to sit down at your next meal and actually take 20 minutes, you know, 30 minutes would be more ideal to actually sit and eat and enjoy that. Maybe it's over company. Um, maybe you listen to one of your podcasts, you know, in a relaxing environment, taking time to enjoy that meal. Um, and my third tip would be what can you add to that meal to make it more healthy? Um, so is it chia seeds? Is it some olive oil? Is it an avocado? Is it, you know, what can you add to that to add a little oomph to hold you over just a little bit more? Mm -hmm. Good, good idea. Those would be like my top three tips. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's some great tips. So would you tell us about your free gift for our listeners? Yeah. So I am giving away a free detox guide and this is not what you would normally think of as a detox talks. 
Um, it, it really is a whole foods detox or whole foods cleanse. And one of the reasons I think this is so important is that our bodies are bombarded with chemicals and environmental toxins and things that we can't always control, but sometimes things that we can. And I think just doing a, a little quick reset every, you know, every quarter or something for a few days is really valuable in understanding and helping the body to metabolize food, um, helping to take the stress off of that, which is going to help your GI system. You know, it's going to help your gut issues as well as your total health. So I'm giving away a free detox guide. Um, it goes into how you can detox eat, uh, naturally without food. And I'm also going to, in there, there's recipes for, uh, for detoxing and things like that. So it's kind of chock full with a lot of things that you can do that don't require a bunch of supplements, but just natural things that's going to help jumpstart your body back into that natural food. Low. Um, it goes into snacking and um, intermittent fasting as well as some other things you can do. So that's the free guide. Um, it's pretty in-depth and should help you get started on a natural detox. All right. And that is at go.simplerootswellness.com backslash simple dash detox dash guide. And that will yep. also be on our speaker uh, page, so you can go click on the link there as well, but just so that you have more than one location with this information. Um, and right. if somebody wants to connect with you more, um, how would they go about doing that? Right. And I think the detox guide, if you, mm -hmm. oh, maybe, yeah, that's right. Okay. Go.simplerits.com. I thought you could do it without the, the hashtag. Um, but I think, okay. okay, so if you want to connect with me more, you can find me at simpleritzwellness.com or um, alexa at simpleritzwellness.com is my email address. And then my social media is always Alexa Sherm. Um, so yeah, find me there. I have a podcast where I give away, um, you know, I interview experts and give away a lot of advice. I even have some, some more information on there on snacking and intermittent fasting. So. All right. Well, thank you, Alexa, for joining me today. And, yeah, thank you. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Come back tomorrow for more of the Gut Health Turnaround series.